Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm really delighted to be here. I have many old friends, and it was nice to see them. In Norway, you take for granted that civil society is essential for democracy. The first sentence of the concept paper for this conference reads, quote, civil society is important in shaping society and democracy by broadening people's participation and increasing people's voice. That sentence assumes a number of things. Democracy is a good thing. People matter. Participation should be broad and inclusive. And voice should be strengthened. But is that so? How much of the world shares these four assumptions? I will come back to this. But for now, let's stay within the frame and ask, what are the trends around civic space? By now, these facts must be depressingly familiar to you. I'm sure you know them well, but let me highlight a few. The organization Civicus tracks threats to civic space around the world. In 2015, last year, they found that one or more types of threats in 109 countries of the world. They found that 3.2 billion people, or about half the world's population, lives in countries that can be classified as repressed or closed in terms of civic space. Only eight countries in the world are classified as open. And in many democracies, mature democracies, such as the US or Australia, civic space is in fact narrowing. If you have been a reader of these Civicus reports, or if you read their monitor, you see that the trend seems, the data at least suggests that the trend is getting worse. Another key group, the International Center for Nonprofit Law, ICNL, uses similar but a different and a tighter set of indicators, and these are the trends they find. That in between 2012 and 2015, 70 countries have proposed or enacted restrictive measures to contain civil society. Counted differently, they have documented 140 restrictive initiatives during this time. What sorts of restrictions are these? To give you a sense, about half of them impede the formation or the operation of civil society, just civil society being able to operate. About a fifth constrain freedom of assembly, being able to meet, and the rest restrict resource mobilization, fundraising, and other issues. So these data are worrying enough, but behind these data are some really chilling stories some of which we've heard this morning from the other speakers. <clears throat> what is really worrying is that some of these actions are happening in the countries that only five, ten years ago were seen as the brightest stars of liberal democracy. Let me give you a few examples. In the land of perhaps the world's most iconic freedom fighter and the country which perhaps has the most ambitious liberal constitution, South Africa, we see a rise of xenophobia, attacks on basic freedoms, and undermining of key institutions. In the Philippines, a government that until recently was known for democratic innovations and transparency has been replaced by a democratically elected president who talks proudly about slaughtering poor people suspected of drug trafficking without any regard to due process. In Brazil, a workers' revolutionary party that tried to reverse decades of oligarchy and racist policies has been replaced through a constitutional sleight of hand with a government of the old elite with, without, which has, without apology, an all-white male cabinet and is proud of it. Across much of Latin America, even as the old order of military dictatorships is over, Impunity is all too common. In too many countries, people continue to be disappeared without any consequence. And human rights defenders like Berta Ceceres are openly murdered, often with the involvement of government security forces working in cahoots with corrupt business interests. In Europe, which you know much better than I, you see the signs with Brexit, with the electoral outcomes in many places, with the opinion polls in France, with the rise of the legitimization of intolerant voices, including in this country. What was unimaginable only a decade ago 
now becomes a reality. Perhaps no country reflects this shift more than Hungary. Hungary holds a special place for me personally. I spent a fair amount of my time there when I was a student during the old communist days. In fact, the first time I ever came across the term civil society was at a congress organized by Civicus in Budapest, where Civicus was founded. And yet today, its democratically elected president speaks proudly of illiberal democracy and points to Russia and Turkey as examples to emulate. In my own country, Tanzania, our new president, Magufuli, enjoys wide popularity for cracking down on corruption and government pay waste, but with a strongman authoritarian style that has little space for democratic process. The proceedings of parliament are no longer broadcast live, People who express criticism on social media, such as WhatsApp, have been prosecuted. A new media bill restricts media and the past in parliament. The opposition have been told they can no longer hold public rallies. They have to wait for the elections another four years from now. And LGBT groups are attacked and denied vital services like ARVs. And finally, Exactly one month ago today in the country where I now live and work, we realized in painful slow motion that the people had just elected a president whose campaign had regularly disparaged black people, Latinos, Muslims, women, people with disabilities, that had talked about closing borders and building walls, that had celebrated the strong man tactics of President Putin, and in the aftermath of this election, this president has tweeted questioning the very right of protest, of free speech, of free press. I could go on, but you get the drift. The world has, and perhaps will continue to, take a dark turn. The very values that underpin this conference are under question and under threat. This shift is real and has huge consequences. I think nothing that I've said so far is news to you or should surprise you. But I think the point is that it will not be sufficient to condemn it. It will not be smart of us to double down on what we have been doing, support the regimes and the civil society groups that reflect what we think is valuable, to continue to profess the liberal values we cherish and not pause to understand what's happening. I think we need to pause and try to fathom what is driving these changes. We need to come to, come to terms with the fact that a lot of these changes are popular. They are supported by large numbers of people. While it is convenient to have the image of a minority authoritarian regime clamping down on the people, the inconvenient truth is that in many of these countries, it is the people, or large numbers of people, who are seen to support these changes. Allow me to quote at some length a recent piece in Foreign Affairs magazine by Andrea Kendall Taylor and Erica Franz, titled How Democracies Fall Apart, which I think is different. In the old days, democracies fall, fell apart through coups, through military coups. We have a more insidious reality now, so I quote. The objectives of contemporary populists are not new. Like most of the historical predecessors in Latin America and Europe, Today's populist parties extol the virtues of strong and decisive leadership, share a disdain for established institutions, and express deep distrust of perceived experts and elites. But the tactics that today's populists employ to implement their vision of iron rule have evolved. Rather than orchestrating sudden and decisive breaks with democracy, which can elicit domestic and international condemnation, they have learned instead from populist fields, fuel strongmen. What do they do? These leaders first come to power through democratic elections and subsequently harness widespread discontent and gradually undermine 
institutional constraints to their role, to their rule, marginalize the opposition, erode civil society. The playbook is consistent and straightforward. Deliberately install loyalists in key positions of power, particularly in the judiciary and security services, neutralize the media by buying it, legislating against it, and enforce censorship. This strategy makes it very hard to discern when the break with democracy actually occurs, and its insidiousness poses one of the most significant threats to democracy in the 21st century. I think the point being made here <clears throat> is that it's like the boiling frog. It happens slowly and you don't quite know at which point to intervene before it is too late. So if we are interested in strengthening civil society in this context, I think the two most important questions we need to grapple with are as follows. First, if civil society is about the people part of democracy, as the world takes an illiberal, intolerant, populist fuel turn to authoritarianism, where was, where is civil society? And the second question, as civil society is increasingly under threat or restricted, why is it that the authorities can clamp down and get away with it? Why is it that people are not rising up to defend their institutions? I think if we do not grapple with these two questions, then we will have missed the point. So I'd like you to take a moment, just turn to your neighbor, and just for a minute, see if you discuss these two questions among yourselves. I'll just give you two minutes. So just turn to your neighbor and and see what you think of this. I'll repeat the questions. If civil society is part of democracy, where is it as the world takes a illiberal turn? And why is it that authoritarian regimes are able to get away with it? Just two minutes, turn to your neighbor. Okay, but I started. All right. Our, uh, sorry to interrupt, but you can see from the sound in the room that there are a lot of ideas about this, and I wish, I wish we had time to hear from you. Perhaps during the breaks we can do that. But let me tell you, let me tell you my proposition. We often correctly, in my view, interpret recent developments, developments as a lack of confidence in government. In my view, perhaps equally, if not more so, you can also interpret the events as a failure of civil society to represent and give voice to people. That at the deeper heart of the crisis today, much more than even the authoritarian repression of civil society, is the lack of popular legitimacy of progressive civil society. Where does civil society actually derive its legitimacy? If you listen to Chris Stone of the Open Society Foundation, he says there are really two things. One is the human rights framework, an appeal to universal values such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That's what a lot of the legitimacy was derived on. And a lot of it was promoted by countries like Norway. But the world has changed, and the powers that 
that countries such as this had, such as the US had in promoting those values, no longer holds. If that is indeed true, as Chris says, then these bases were not very deep, not very rooted. In 2008, when I, was, when I finished my work at Hakielimu, I spent many months traveling across East Africa. As a civil society person, I was just interested in seeing the impact of civil society across those places. It was very simple. I went and I stayed with people. I got on a bus, got off, introduced myself. People are very welcoming and simply spent time there. What I found was shocking. In the scheme of what matters to people's lives as they fulfill, they try to pursue their aspirations, civil society was not even in the top 10. It was not in the top 20. It didn't matter whether we were talking about international NGOs, the Oxfams and the Norwegian church aids, or whether we were talking about national organizations like the one I had been running, or community-based organizations. It did not connect with people's lives. If you look at the many analyses of the elections in the US right now, one that I would recommend to you is a, is a set of essays and a book by Catherine Kramer, a, a, a professor at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, called The Politics of Resentment. She does the similar method. She, does it, she goes to people, to coffee shops, gas stations, and listens to how people talk to each other, how friends talk to their neighbors. What you'll find is chilling around the erosion of civil society. These stories do not mean that civil society is not needed, but it means that the work of building civil society is much harder than we had thought. Let me highlight two aspects. The first, as we know, is that globalization, the evidence shows, has generally been of great use, has benefited more people. But it is equally true that globalization has produced losers and left, left people behind. And this matters not only in an absolute sense, but it also matters perhaps even more so in a relative sense. If I am doing absolutely better, but I'm doing worse than my neighbor, or I am not doing as well as I'd hoped to do, then I will be frustrated and angry. This is about redistribution for sure, but it is much more than that. As the economist Joe Stiglitz has pointed out, we need to address the underlying rules of the game of the economy. Markets are not neutral. The fact that we have deep inequality in the world is not an accident. It's because the underlying rules reflect certain biases and preferences. My colleague K. Sabil Rahman, who is a lawyer, a law professor, goes further and talks about domination. I deeply I, I encourage you to read his book called Domination and Democracy that has just come out. And he shows how many people, when they experience that corporations have impact on their lives that they cannot control, that they cannot do anything about, that private interests have greater sway on government and there is nothing you can do about that 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 can be a deeply undermining, humiliating experience. So if civil society is to find its legitimacy, it needs to speak compellingly to this concern in ways that resonate with people's lives. The second consideration I think here that's really important is it's not only about civil society, the numbers of civil society. It's not about how many NGOs there are, it's not also about the amount of civic voice. It's about how representative is this civic voice. Um, Scholzman, Verbein, and Brady and I, uh, make this point that the level of participation has consequences for democracy. Citizen voice that emanates from a limited number of activists might lack the legitimacy of activity of a larger group. This doesn't mean you want everybody, I'm not naive enough to think that everybody should participate. But in civil society, you should see yourself reflected among the civic actors that are there. If the voices that are speaking out, the voices that have a seat at the table, do not look like you, do not speak like you, do not make you feel that they are ones that they are fighting for you, then you will have a sense that you are left, that you are left out. <clears throat> if civil society is to find its legitimacy, it will need to be able to speak to this voice. So in conclusion, what does this mean for NORAD? I want to point out four things. 
First, civil society work matters even more now. One kroner invested in deepening civil society will save 10 kroners later in trying to clean up the conflict and the alienation that it will build. But it's not the civil society building of projects that we need. It is the deep democratic work that we're talking about. What does this mean? Second point, it's about constituency building. How did democracy get built in Norway, in Sweden, and in many other countries which have vibrant democracy? It was the deep democratic work of constituency building, not just trying to do instrumental band-aids. That is the deep work that needs to happen across the world. Third, it's not about civil society against government. It's about civil society as a pathway to get people to reclaim government. State building in that sense is a core task of civil society itself. The, the policy roles, the watchdog roles, all of those sorts of things are important. But when they are not rooted, in the, if the ecosystem of actors does not include strong constituency groups, then these actors will float on the ground. So my final point is around the funding. I think the funding really needs to continue to happen, but it, the question that you need to ask yourself is, is it funding that is building the democracy of the sort we need, or is it undermining it? If it's about intermediaries, such as Norwegian intermediaries, the question I'd like to ask them is, in what ways are you adding value to deepening democracy in the countries that we build? I see my time is up, so I will stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>